afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our virtual 1870 Society annual lunch. My name is Sue Hunt, and it's my privilege to be the Chief Executive Officer of the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation. Can I begin by acknowledging that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal people who are with us today. Can I also acknowledge Associate Professor Cathy Quinlan, who's very uh, kindly uh, agreed to join us to talk to us at the lunch. Like many of you, we are all learning to work different ways. So we're really grateful that you've been able to join us online today. Uh, a couple of things, a bit of housekeeping. We're trialling live captioning today. So you'll be able to view that by clicking on the live transcript button on the menu below. These captions are automatically generated, so they won't be perfect, but hopefully they'll be useful to some of you. And we'd also love to hear from you this afternoon, so please use the chat function to tell us your name and where you're from. I might even call out a few people if you're game enough to use the chat function. The 1870 Society, named in honour of the hospital's founding year, celebrates those of you who are thinking about, or who have already chosen, to change the future of children's health by leaving a gift in will. The Society is our way of expressing thanks to you, and we're really deeply, deeply grateful. Our annual lunch is also an opportunity for everyone interested in this special type of giving to come together. So this year, of course, it's online. We can't join each other together in person, but we thought we wanted to do this to continue to build your connection with the hospital and with one another. So it is, of course, your opportunity also to hear directly from one of our clinicians and one of our great researchers on a special topic that is of interest to her. This year marks 150 years of the hospital providing outstanding care to Victoria's children. And it's safe to say when we started this year, when we started 2020, none of us expected it to turn out quite the way it did. So it's been a challenging year for many of us and many of you. And I would like to take this opportunity to wish you and your loved ones the very best as we continue to navigate COVID-19. And I do hope that you're keeping safe and well, looking after yourselves, physically distancing and, and keeping the hygiene levels up. So here at the hospital, of course, the RCH has had to adapt and innovate its way of caring for children and their families. And of course, we're even innovating today because we, we have our masks on and we're physically distanced as well. But the hospital, thanks to the help of our supporters, has been able to uh, face this challenge head on, just like it has for the past 150 years, just like it has when the great health challenges have come up before. I'd like to now um, play a short video to remind us of just how special and unique this hospital is.
an incredible picture of that, that which makes up our wonderful hospital, isn't it? Um, thanks to everybody. There's a few folk who have said hi, so I'm going to read those names out. So Chris Cunningham, who's on the hospital board. Hi, Chris. Thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, Kathy Novak has said hi, and Bev Miller and Maria Seaman, all 1870 Society members, and Professor Jim Angus, who is on the uh, foundation board and is also chair of our campus council, says hi. David Mandel, who uh, I think just recently completed his time on the hospital board. David, welcome. And Dr Miriam Weiss is also, has also said hi. Miriam's our president of auxiliaries and also on the foundation board. And uh, we have 46 attendees um, online right now. And I'd also like to welcome Rebecca Cowan, who's the newly appointed uh, executive director of the Good Friday Appeal. Rebecca, Rebecca thanks so much for, for, uh, for calling in as well. So I think when we look at that video, it's incredible to reflect on the past 150 years and to think of how far we've come with the support of our community, which has been with us all since 1870 itself. Yet, of course, we know that there is so much more to do, don't we? Today, we're going to focus on one particular area where the work that's happening here on campus is quite extraordinary. It's something that we're very thrilled with the Foundation to be able to support and it is an area of genetic kidney disease. And so, as I said before, we're fortunate that Associate Professor Kathy Quinlan has joined us. Kathy uh, leads the Kidney Flagship. It's a visionary research program focusing on genetic kidney disease, starting in children and extending into adulthood. The world's leading project brings together the RCH Kidney Genetic Service and the Murdoch Children's Research Institute Kidney Regeneration Group. So we are really fortunate to have the MCRI here on site bringing research and clinical practice together. We meet, that means that the latest research can quickly be translated into practice and improve the health outcomes for our children. Before I hand over to Cathy, we'd love for you to ask questions after her presentation. So once again, please um, um, type them in the chat function uh, and I'll attempt to moderate those questions um, after Cathy's presented. So now I'm delighted to hand over to Associate Professor Quinlan, who's going to tell us more about her groundbreaking research. Cathy. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sue. And it's an absolute pleasure to have been invited along to talk today and to tell people a bit about the work that we've been doing here at the Children's. Um, so before, before I start my talk, I'd like you all to take a minute um, and to picture something for me. I'd like you all to imagine a world without kidney disease. Now, for those of you who don't know anyone with kidney disease, this is going to be challenging, so I'll help and try to paint a picture for you. So imagine that I click my fingers and I change all the rules. From now on, you can only drink 500 mils of water each day. You can't eat anything salty or high in protein. And your taste buds have changed so that even water tastes wrong. Every morning, lunchtime and evening, you take a handful of tablets. And every night, just as you want to relax, you have to set up and start your dialysis machine. All this so you don't die of kidney failure, even though you feel pretty rubbish most of the time anyway. Now, this is a reality for 12,000 people across Australia who are waiting for a kidney transplant that may never come. I'm a kidney doctor. I look after children and their families as they deal with the best and the worst of times. When I break this news to families, I focus on the bright side. I hope that it will work out well. I plan for all eventualities, and I know that their family life is a million miles from where they thought it would be. As a kidney doctor, I know that dialysis is a poor substitute for kidney function and that all of the medications I prescribe have side effects. As a kidney doctor, I know that the number of patients on dialysis is increasing by 10% each year, that one in 10 Australians have kidney disease, that dialysis costs us as a nation $1 billion each year, that it's the commonest reason to be admitted to hospital and that my tiny patients have the same risk of having a heart attack or a stroke as an 80-year-old. So I want, I need, to imagine a world without kidney disease. Because what if we could stop all of this before it starts? 
Now, I moved to RCH seven years ago from Great Ormond Street in London. And I moved because the foundation funded my dream job, a clinical consultant post with half my time funded to set up a research programme, allowing me to deliver care to patients with kidney disease, which is my life's work, and to ensure a brighter future for children with kidney disease across the world, which is my life's passion. And when I arrived at this beautiful hospital, um, I was fortunate to be given a clinic on a Wednesday where I got chatting to Sue White, who is a clinical geneticist who is just as passionate and just as chatty as I am. And after several discussions while we were weighing our patients, uh, we decided that we needed to set up a renal genetic service here at the RCH. And we were joined by like-minded individuals in Ella Wilkins, who is a talented clinical um, genetics counsellor, and Zernitza Stark, a clinical geneticist with a focus on acute care genomics. Now, having identified that we wanted to set up a clinical service, we embarked on a service design journey. We set up patient engagement events, established a website, uh, we spoke to clinicians internationally and to potential referrers from around the country. We ran educational events, workshops, we designed and developed informational movies and pamphlets. And this process and the mindset that it provoked in us has shaped every aspect of our clinical and research program ever since. Because using this patient-centred design focus, it broadened our focus from merely examining diagnostic yield and on into health economics, implementation science, patient experience, clinical utility, um, and created a really strong focus on team building and on communication and equity. And what we learned from this journey was that nephrologists and trainees across Australia lacked confidence in genomic medicine, but were very, very enthusiastic about it. That the more experienced our respondent was, the more they supported the idea of centralised renal genetic services that were multidisciplinary in nature. So that means a clinic where we have a nephrologist or a kidney doctor, a clinical geneticist and a genetic counsellor all working together to assess the patient and the family. We also found that our patients and their families were very keen to find out the cause of their condition and were hugely supportive of research. So with the support of the foundation, we opened the doors of the RCH Renal Genetic Service in 2015. And our design process um, resulted in a clinical workflow that has proven incredibly effective and it's been emulated by other subspecialty teams across RCH and across the world. And furthermore, we use the pilot data from our first year in, in um, operation to achieve funding to spread our clinic model across Victoria and into adult practice so that we now run clinics at the Austin, the Royal Melbourne and Monash Paediatrics and Adulthood, which provides equitable access to genomic sequencing for patients with kidney disease for the first time in Victoria. We've had patients referred to our service from before they were born until 72 years of age although the median age of patients seen across our service is 29, and the median age of patients' first referral to nephrology services is 16. And what I'm going to just describe to you now is the first 204 patients who have been seen through our service. And our service is very representative of the Victorian cohort with renal disease um, in terms of age, ethnicity, and the prevalence of consanguinity. Before I tell you some of our findings, I should pause and point out that the published literature at the point when we set up our service, and still until last week, was that the diagnostic yield in this type of cohort would be about 10%. So out of those 204 people, we would have expected around about 21 to have received a diagnosis through our service. But in fact, 80 patients, or 39%, received a molecular diagnosis through our service. Um, and that means that they got an answer to why they had kidney disease. Three patients received a diagnosis that explained their overall problem, but did not at this point in time explain their kidney disease. And 17 patients received a negative result that was clinically important to them. So sometimes that means that we have ruled out something very significant that leaves the other option. 
And that can be very important, particularly in transplant planning. We also had 50 patients, 52 patients, who received a result that at this point in time is not diagnostic because we are either waiting for our own science or the science of others across the world and the literature across the world to build up enough that we can make it diagnostic. So what you can see from all those little people left on the screen is that very few people who come through our service do not get an answer of some sort. But of course, we didn't just set up our service to give people an answer. We wanted to know how useful this test actually was. And so we looked at what's called the clinical utility of our testing. And what we found is that having a diagnosis had management implications for 47 of the 80 patients. So that's 59% of our group. This included changing surveillance for extra renal manifestations in 35 patients. This means that we found out that patients were either at risk or were no longer at risk of developing complications such as blindness, deafness or liver failure. And so we either needed to start or stop testing for this. We were able to change their treatment plan for 16 patients. And in some cases, that meant this meant starting a new medication. And in other cases, it meant that we were able to stop a medication with significant side effects that was simply never going to work. We were able to change their diagnostic pathway for 11 patients. And for 10 of them, that meant that we were able to skip a kidney biopsy, which is quite a significant procedure, particularly for children or those who are very medically infirm as adults. And for 66 patients, this had a wider implication for the family. This meant that other people in the family were able to be tested and find out if they either had the condition or didn't have it. They were able to make different, they were able to make changes to their reproductive plans. Um, and they were also potentially able to go forward as kidney donors to their relatives. And so we felt that our clinical service had very much proven a high diagnostic yield, which was world leading and we just published this work last week. And we've also been able to show that it is useful to patients in the clinic. So while all of this work was in train, I also worked together with colleagues across the country to set up a national network so that we could offer the same service to patients across the states and territories of Australia. And this is called the KidGen Collaborative. It is a group of clinicians and researchers with an interest in genetic kidney disease. And we now run clinics almost across the entire country. And something we were always very acutely aware of is that change doesn't happen in healthcare just because we will it and because we think it will be useful. And so crucial to our project was making the sustainable health economic argument for diagnostic genomic sequencing in patients with kidney disease. Being very aware that the arguments that we make for patients with kidney disease can be applicable to those with other conditions as well. Diagnostics in renal disease are very underdeveloped and they're relatively unchanged in the last 50 years. And while genomic sequencing has the, the potential to completely transform how we diagnose patients, there's no data or there was no data to tell us at what point in the diagnostic paradigm our sequencing would have the most power. So we set up a study to um, figure out at what point in time we should be offering the sequencing that we offer. We focused on glomerular disease, which accounts for more than 30% of patients with genetic kidney disease, and we aimed to determine the, the cost effectiveness of genomic sequencing when compared to standard investigations. And this economic evaluation was undertaken from the Australian healthcare system perspective, and we had a time horizon from presentation to three months following the test result based on current available evidence. And when calculating costs, we worked from the bottom up. So we didn't just cost out how much it cost to do the test. We cost out how much it cost to come to the clinic, be assessed, receive the test, and then come back again for another result. And what did we fi find? Well, we first started by costing out the standard diagnostic pathway. So for glomerular disease, this is patients receiving blood tests, urinalysis, and a kidney biopsy. Um, and we were shocked to discover that it costs $5,700 to diagnose a child or to, to bring a child through this pathway, but only 4% of them will actually get a diagnosis. And that makes the cost of diagnosis a ridiculous $143,000. And prior to our clinic opening, this was the standard pathway, and it still is for many children across the world. 
Utilising genomic sequencing after the biopsy, which is a, was a common pathway for children across the world who had access to sequencing, um, increases the diagnostic rate to about 40%, so from 4% to 40, which is good, and gives a cost per diagnosis of 23,000. And that certainly makes a compelling argument for having the availability of sequencing. But if we could do the sequencing earlier, um, prior to the immunological workup and prior to the biopsy, then the diagnostic rate goes from 4% to 42%, with a per patient cost of 4,700 and a cost per diagnosis of $11,000, which is incredible and completely blows out of the water the idea that genomic sequencing is an expensive investigation. So what we had determined by showing this is that for a subset of patients, the availability of rapid results was incredibly important. So we set up a project to look at the impact of early genomic and early rapid genomic sequencing. So when we started our project, results were back in about eight months. By the time we finished it, our standard turnaround time was three months. But through the use of um, dedicated streamlined pathways through our diagnostic lab, we are able to give results back to patients with a standard turnaround time now of two weeks where necessary. So we recruited in 10 patients, seven of them were children. They were aged from a month in age to 55 years of age to have rapid, rapid sequencing. Um, and what we found is that five of them received a definitive diagnosis. One received a diagnosis which we're in the process of proving is actually the cause of their kidney disease. Um, one had a variant of uncertain significance in a relevant gene and one patient had a negative result that allowed a transplant two weeks later to go ahead. And again, patients had a massive, it was a massive impact on their care by actually doing these tests. So we were able to change management for two, change surveillance for three, progress to a transplant for one patient, which was incredibly significant and avoid a high risk biopsy in an adult who had cardiac disease and was on blood thinning medication for one patient. Now alongside our growing expertise in testing and in counselling, we had been establishing um, a gene discovery and disease modelling programme here on campus, together with Professor Melissa Little, who co-leads the Kidney Flagship with myself. We brought together teams from across the campus to work together to understand how kidney disease develops so that we can figure out how to stop it in its tracks. And a landmark discovery made by our lab in 2015 was the first reported protocol for the directed differentiation of induced pluripotent stem cells to multicellular kidney organoids by Professor Melissa Little and Minoru Takasato. These are essentially mini kidneys in a dish, approximating a first trimester human kidney. Though obviously it would be amazing if we could transplant these into people and obviously we're working on that. We are also interested in using organoids created from our patients to understand disease mechanisms and identify therapies. So while we were discussing how we could use these organoids um, to develop a drug screening tool, I met Charlotte. Um, Charlotte presented to um, my care, to medical services, at seven weeks of age, acutely unwell, and was rapidly diagnosed with congenital nephrotic syndrome. Now, the natural history of this condition is very sadly death in the first few months of life from overwhelming sepsis. But we have very good treatment regimens now that means that we can, um, through a combination of surgery and medical care, can keep children alive and allow them to thrive. And um, she received a kidney transplant at the age of five. And this is her about six hours, I think, after the transplant. <laughs> you can see she's just <laughs> the most amazing child who lights up every room she's ever in. She's phenomenal. Um, and she was found on testing to have a compound heterozygous change in a gene um, called nephrin, which encodes, or called NPHS1, which encodes a protein called nephrin. And we recruited her into the disease modelling arm of our study. Now, we're very fortunate in MCRI to have researchers who are all absolutely world leaders in what they do. And one of them is Sarah Howden, who now leads the MCRI gene editing facility. And she was the first to publish a simultaneous reprogramming and gene correction protocol. So she was able to take a blood sample from Charlotte and correct the gene mutation using CRISPR-Cas9. And that allowed us to make a batch of stem cells from a blood sample that Charlotte gave that was identical to Charlotte and a second batch that were identical to her except that they didn't have um, congenital nephrotic syndrome. 
and we then made tiny kidneys from both batches. And we were able to demonstrate that one set of the kidneys indeed had congenital nephrotic syndrome and were deficient in nephrine and also potassium, um, and the other set of kidneys were normal. And the next step with these is to use them as drug screening tools to find compounds that can bring nephrine to the surface of the slit diaphragm. We can then use this to trial an agent in the next kid like Charlotte that we meet. And we can potentially use it to reduce the progression of kidney disease in adults who can have milder forms of this disease. So what we've achieved over the last seven years at RCH has been extraordinary and not something that I had entirely envisioned when I moved here. So we've established a world leading clinical service which offers diagnostic genomic sequencing and the ability to recruit patients into novel gene discovery, disease modelling and clinical trials. The work we've done with groups such as the Translational Genomics Unit has established processes that are benefiting children with genetic disease in different organs such as the heart or the brain. Our group has grown and split into defined disease modelling and gene editing facilities that are used for multiple groups far beyond the kidney, so that we now have researchers on campus <coughs> growing brain tissue, heart, model, heart muscle, eyes, and using these to personalise chemotherapy for children with leukaemia. Last year, I spent time following and um, visiting different clinical and research facilities across the world when we were still able to travel um, to see how to optimise the work that we do here in Melbourne. And many places around the world, in the US and Canada and in Europe, are doing interesting work, but nowhere in the world has the broad spectrum of expertise available in one site like we have here. All of this has been made possible by the investment of the Foundation, thanks to people like you. And I can't thank you enough. The funding we have received from the Foundation has allowed us to dream big. It has enabled us to attract further funding. And crucially, it has allowed us to imagine a world without kidney disease. So I'm going to leave you with a few pictures of some of the children and adults whose lives have been changed by the renal genetic service that your funding has established. Thank you. Cathy, thank you so much for such an interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Truly wonderful. And I think to, to see the vision of the children that have, have been affected and the families whose lives have been changed as well really brings it home. So thank you so much um, for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, over to you. Your questions, please, um, in the chat function. And while those are coming through, um, I thought I might kick off, Cathy, with one or two questions while we wait, if that's OK. Um, can I bring you to, I think, perhaps, uh, first of all, something just very clinical and I think would be in a lot of people's minds. Mm -hmm. Health services have been under terrible pressure all through the year, of course, and we've moved to a lot of telehealth um, as part of our, our pivoting. How have you found the experience of using telehealth in your patient care and do you think you could continue to use it in the future? Mm, that's a fascinating question, particularly because we had quite a large research meeting yesterday asking how to design a project wow. to assess what we think anyway. We have found telehealth to be in a lot of cases better for our clinics, for re specifically for renal genetics, than before. And I think this is partly because we have many, many, many people in the clinic. And when we do a telehealth clinic, we have one box with the counsellor, one box with the geneticist, one box with me, and one box with the family. Um, and the, a lot of our clinics are a lot of talking, not so much examining, and a lot of talking. And the parents are not as distracted by their children running around as they would be usually in our rooms. So we actually find the communication is working really, really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, I think we will definitely continue this afterwards, particularly for families who otherwise would have travelled from um, rural Victoria rather than people that are just down the road from us. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, it's, it's making a significant difference, isn't it, for mm. the hospital's ability to deliver great care everywhere. Absolutely. Um, as well, yeah. Um, let me ask you another one. And people can hear it in your presentation that you've got lots of hats. <laughs> you're the MCRI, you're at the you're Royal Children's Hospital. You know, as an associate professor, there's a, at least an honorary appointment with the university. Can you just reflect a little on how advantageous you think it is to have this kind of campus-wide collaboration um, on how we deliver, you know, research translates into patient care? I mean, it's transformative and it's something that I certainly saw when I was overseas. I was spent a good bit of time last year in 
in Northwestern, in, in Chicago, up in Sick Kids, in Toronto and in Great Ormond Street in London again. And most of those sites have not developed with the same sort of integrated model so that actually getting from the ward to the lab requires quite a walk, mm -hmm. different ID cards, just the simple things that feel like there's a barrier between the two sides. Here we're all one campus mm -hmm. and that makes that makes an enormous difference because it means that uh, you have a conversation with a scientist while the clinical scenario is still in your head and you can bring that passion through for people who don't work in clinical medicine so that they really understand the work that they're doing is benefiting patients and benefiting their families directly. I think it, it makes an enormous difference to the quality of the work that we do. It certainly enables me to wear, like you said, Sue, a lot of different hats and go from lecturing medical students to a lab meeting and on to a clinic mm. all really quite smoothly. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so I guess uh, just extending that thought on a bit, we're all been, you know, locked at home in very in, in you know different ways you've had you you doing clinic you're still coming into to the hospital to do the telehealth clinics but what's been um you know what what's how's that kind of collaboration been changed affected for the good or the bad um in during during this year i mean look i think we'd all be lying if we said this hasn't been a challenging year it's been a quite a struggle um for ev for every aspect of the clinical service but i think one thing that we've all really learned is the importance of the social connection mm -hmm. and the importance of actually calling that out and making space for it. So while sometimes before perhaps the conversations would have happened outside of meetings, now we're making 10 minutes at the beginning of each meeting to mm -hmm. actually check in with each other and make sure that everybody is, is well and is happy. And in some ways, I think it's actually strengthened the connection between teams. Yeah. As well as that, because we now do um, have Zoom meetings with each other's children in the background. We have plenty of people across the, the hospital and across the institute who have two partners working in the same home on different teams. So we've actually had quite a bit of cross-pollination, mm. I think, between teams. Yeah. Yeah. I think we'll look back at this year and there will be as many positives as negatives. Yeah, there'll be, there'll be a lot of learnings, won't mm. there? There'll be, uh, yeah, there'll be a lot of positives I think so. as well. Um, just bringing you back to um, to the work and, and the, the, that, that incredibly powerful um, slide about the difference in cost if you can get the, the you know the genomics happening much earlier, mm. um, you're, and and also the the you know the kidney in the petri dish as we call it. Look forward ten years for me, um, Kathy, and tell me you know what what do you think you'll be doing? What will standard practice look like in in ten years time? Well. I would love to say that our kidneys in a dish will be something practical and clinical in 10 years' time, but they won't be. There's, there's going to be huge challenges to getting that into an, into an actually transplantable kidney, and I think we're a few decades away from that. Mm. But having said that, I think we'll be using our organoids to find, to understand disease better and crucially to design therapies that can actually slow it down. Many of the conditions we deal with, children are born with reasonably normal kidney function that degenerates over their lives. So if we can keep them where they are when we meet them as children, we can stop them going into kidney failure in their 30s and make it perhaps that they'll go into kidney failure in their 80s, at which point surely we'll be able to transplant our organoids in 80 years' time. Mm. I think the other thing, and like already we've seen a complete change in how we diagnose patients with their conditions, in, in, and genomic sequencing is a much safer way to make a diagnosis than a kidney biopsy is. And I think that will, we will get faster and we will be doing it far more often. Mm. Yeah, great. Thank you. And we've had a we've had a question come through from uh, someone at home. It's from Chris. Um, extending uh, extending on from the telehealth mm -hmm. question, how can you see the future for virtual health in your patients? Uh, can you see monitoring, keeping patients at home for more complex care and the like? What are the issues we need to overcome for this to be reality? And what would make this great? And, and what do we need need to do to guard against it? Now, Cathy can see all of that written down, so I haven't expected her to remember <laughs> all of that, but I've said that out for everybody um, so you can know. So, yes, telehealth yeah. and its future. I mean, I think this crisis has pushed us to develop in ways that we didn't anticipate before. And certainly one area in which that's really obvious to me is that in my clinical practice, one of my areas of particular interest is um, the dialysis of small infants and babies. And we are now managing some of those children at great remove where perhaps they would have to cross state boundaries and go into quarantine if they actually come down 
to our clinic. So we're trying to do as much as possible at a distance. And so we are using um, photographs of exit sites instead of assessing the exit sites. We are um, getting families to do much more blood pressures and weights at home to send us through far more results from external pathology centres and, and really enabling them to do more of the care at home even than we did before. Remembering that we have families who are doing an organ replacement therapy in their home routinely. These are already pretty phenomenal people. Um, I think in the future there'll be more and more and more of that. So more home monitoring of different things and, and machines and devices that link up with each other and actually feed into us a little bit more robustly than they currently do. I think that is the future and it will be it will be so much better for our patients who instead of coming here once a week will be coming here once every two, three months. Great. Thank you. Uh, and we just have another question come through from um, Elisa. And Elisa, I'd hazard a uh, guess to say, is probably our furthest, uh, furthest distanced person today. So she's in Hong Kong. Um, she's asked, you've mentioned that the foundation donations have allowed us to leverage uh, and collaborate across Australia and, um, and globally. Uh, and so that's allowed us to get more donations and, and, and more leverage in funding. Can you share a little bit more about that for the mm. group so they can just understand about how the donations make that difference and get that leverage happening? Yeah, absolutely. So one probably very good example of that is that the foundation which gave the funding to start off our service, we ran it for a year. We were able to get our data together and what we were able to do for a year and use that data to apply to the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance for funding for a flagship from them. Um, and then the Melbourne Genomics Health Alliance, which is supported by the Victorian state government and several stakeholders from across the health service, including the foundation, I think, in mm. Victoria, um, gave us funding to fund um, adult nephrologists, geneticists, genetic counsellors and testing across three adult sites. And then that has obviously enabled us to get even more information. And we were able to build on that to join an Australian genomics um, flagship, again, a, a really large national effort. And to use the data that we're generating out of all of this to uh, get MBS item listing, so Medicare funding for some of the testing that we're doing, and to make the argument that if we do the even to the hospital and to the hospital board, that if we do this testing early, we actually save the healthcare mm. budget money. Yeah. So it is better to do it early. And that has flow on effects for other diseases as well. It's not just about kidneys. Of course, my world is just about kidneys, but if you can make the argument for kidneys, you can plug in different numbers from different um, health, different mm. organ systems and make that argument for neurology or cardiology or oncology. So mm. it's, it's, it's a powerful way to do it, but you have to have the evidence to get the next bit of funding. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, and we have one more here because I'm holding the... Uh, the ACE card here, and I've got one last question myself for you, but uh, Jessica is asking, is the pioneering modelling that you've described for kidney also changing the momentum of modelling for other organs? And you've just touched on that a little bit, I guess. So, yeah, I mean, so do you think it's actually making any difference yet in other organs? Absolutely. So when we, when Melissa Little, um, who is the head of the Kidney Regeneration Lab and the theme director for Cell Biology and MCRI, when she came down here from Queensland and published that first paper showing that you could take an iPSC cell and produce a multicellular organ. That was groundbreaking and amazing and a kidney first. But what she has managed to then do is leverage that knowledge within the kidneys to develop the stem cell unit. People in her lab have set up the gene editing facility, the iPSC cell generation core within MCRI so that now if you are a heart re researcher or a neurology researcher who wants to grow a bit of your organ, there is now dedicated groups that can help you get the building blocks together for mm. them. And so MCRI has become an absolute world leader in, in or organoid generation mm. because we all talk to each other. You know, that's the amazing yeah. thing about this institute. We all talk to each other. We all learn from each other so that... And we're all informed by the clinical side of things and we all have all of the benefits of being attached to a university as well so that we can all bring each other up. It's that mm -hmm. rising tide lifts all boats yeah. sort of scenario. It's, it's, it's an amazing place to work. I mean, yeah. this isn't my home. I come from <laughs> Ireland. But I feel that working here is the best thing I can do to help children in Ireland with kidney disease because I can hopefully raise the game for everybody right. internationally. Right. Thank you, Kevin. It's a be beautifully put. Um, and I think we always, uh, we always say here at the, at, uh, at the campus that all of that great work and those great minds and the, 
that, that's happening is underpinned and enabled by philanthropy, and, and that's what people who are on this call today, of course, are, are all part of. I have one last question, which I'm sure every single one of them would want me to ask you, and that is... Um, if, if we came to you and said, or if, a, you know, someone came to you today and said, I have a million dollars I'd like to invest in your work, how would you make best use of that investment? Oh, my goodness. That is a tempting idea. I know. It? <laughs> um, so right now there's a lot of patients that I <clears throat> test, but there's a lot of patients I say no to. Mm. And I say no to them because at this point in time, I don't believe I can get them a good result. Uh, who I will test today, though, is different to who I will test five years ago because mm. things have moved <clears> forward. So if I had if I had more money right now, I would broaden the patients that I could offer testing to. Mm. Um, accepting the fact that as time goes on, the clinical budget and the Medicare budget is taking over the, the, the payment of tests that the foundation previously were funding. Mm. So I would just use it to just keep broadening broadening the people that can benefit yeah. from this. Well, and they're very powerful key. slides, both in the reduction in cost, but also your 240 people, Yeah, just how, you know, the impact you have of the... Yeah, Absolutely, because yeah. it, it, it makes such a big impact. And I think having that generosity of funding allows us to look beyond just the how many people can I diagnose and say, well, what about healthcare economics? Could we could we make that argument? And mm. we, we have those people on campus who can help us do that and broaden what we're able to do. Yeah, lovely. Allow us to, to think big. Lovely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, everyone, for the interesting questions that you put through. And, and um, thank you, Cathy Quinlan, for such a thought-provoking presentation and, and incredible answers. Um, and we do hope that the, the work that you continue to do um, is, is, you know, continues to develop in the way that you want it to. Uh, if anyone else has questions uh, that you'd like us to th flow through to, to Cathy, I'm sure she'd be happy to receive them afterwards. So either to Jessica or to myself, very happy uh, to, uh, to keep the conversation going. Uh, our last speaker um, I'd like to introduce you to is our, um, our wonderful chairman of the RCH Foundation and my friend uh, Peter Yates. Uh, we recorded this message uh, from Peter earlier in the week uh, just because our technology is... He, he couldn't be here in the room, of course, because he's in lockdown. So we recorded earlier in the week. I believe he's on the, um, on the virtual lunch anyway. Uh, but I'd like to uh, just introduce Peter's video message to you now. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Yates and I'm the chairman of the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation and proud member of the 1870 Society. I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you for your visionary commitment to our hospital. I'm obviously disappointed that we can't meet in person today due to COVID-19, uh, but this virus will pass. Uh, uh, but the challenges of providing our kids with great care is with us forever. The 1870 Society celebrates those of you who are thinking about or have chosen to leave a lasting gift that extends beyond your lifetime. In my mind, this type of giving is an investment in the future of our children's health. And what more important investment could there be? Gifts in will enable talented individuals like Associate Professor Quinlan to dream big, to think about how she can solve today's medical challenges and be prepared for tomorrow's. Your support means that the RCH and our campus partners, the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and the University of Melbourne's Department of Paediatrics can plan for the future with confidence. And this certainly is a big part of why our wonderful world-leading hospital continues to be able to provide sick children and their families with the very best healthcare. We know this will be more important than ever in the months and years ahead. In fact, a quarter of the RCH Foundation's support to the hospital is made possible thanks to the gifts in will we receive each year. Some of these gifts are linked to areas of the hospital with great personal significance to our donors. Others are untied, meaning they support the area of greatest need across a campus. And what's so powerful about it? is that it enables us to say yes right away to new opportunities and breakthroughs as they arise. It means the hospital can purchase the latest equipment specifically designed for children, that the RCH can pioneer new initiatives in patient care, 
that our teams receive ongoing education and training to ensure they remain at the forefront of paediatric healthcare. And significantly, gifts in will are fundamental to our investment in research, seeking new treatments and cures for childhood illness and disease, as you've heard today. Right now, right across our campus, gifts in will are saving lives and protecting generations of children to come. Thank you, not only to those of you who have already included a gift to the RCH Foundation in your will, but also to all of you who are considering doing so. These are very challenging times, and I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. We're very appreciative of your support and commitment to our hospital. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the lunch, even if it's only virtual. Thank you, Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for your visionary commitment to the hospital and to children's health. I hope you can see just how transformational that legacy is going to be. As we've heard, much of the work taking place right now across the campus is only made possible thanks to philanthropy and people like you. Usually at our annual lunch, we give those of you who've let us know of your intention a gift, um, a small token of our appreciation. This year, instead, we'll be posting that to you, a letter of thanks and also our 1870 Society pin in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye out for, uh, for Australia Post's delivery in the letterbox. If anyone has any questions about making a gift in your will or um, has already taken this wonderful step but haven't told us yet, uh, Jessica would love to hear from you. We, we want to include you in this group. We want to include you in our, um, in our community and in our connection. So please do let us know um, so we can actually um, thank you uh, right now and thank you in the years ahead. You can also for, uh, find out more about it on our website at rchfoundation.org.au. And so just to close off today's virtual lunch, we just wanted to take the opportunity to leave you with a short video. It's a wonderful video. It was produced as part of our 150th anniversary, which is this year. And it's a great reminder to all of us that dreaming big is important and not to let the challenges of today limit the possibilities of tomorrow. And before we say uh, farewell, I just wanted to sincerely thank you for your commitment to the Royal Children's Hospital. We're fortunate to have supporters like you. We're fort fortunate to have our wonderful foundation family, our great hospital supporters. You're passionate about our hospital and you're passionate about changing the future of children's health. And I know that gives great meaning and joy in all of your lives. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, won't, I won't be held responsible if there's a tear in your eye at the end of this video. Thank you and I look forward to seeing you all again soon.